live. Great. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker for today. Um, James Irvine, after uh, Irvin, I should say, after a, a career in the shipping industry, uh, retired and then indulged in his twin passions of genealogy and the history of the Orkney Islands. And he has published several books in that regard, edited several others, and he also runs one of the largest uh, surname DNA projects on family tree DNA, the, the Clan Irwin DNA project. And because it is such a large project, James is probably one of the most experienced uh, Y-DNA project administrators uh, that is around today. And today he's going to talk us, to us about the Y-DNA of this Scots-Irish diaspora and what it tells us about the Irish people living in Ireland today, uh, the Scottish people living in Scotland today, and of course the uh, immigrants, uh, immigrants who went off to America and various other places around the world uh, that carry the Irwin or Irvin name. So please give a very warm welcome to James Irvin. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as you'll tell from my accent, I'm English, born in England, very proud of it. But I was actually brought up just over there. Um, I learned my first experience of family history on the Hollywood Hills, and I can see them from here. So this is coming home from me. My maternal side was Scots-Irish, but that's coincidental. It gives me the background, but I won't be talking about that today. Um, but it's just lovely to be back. And my uncle and brother-in-law both worked here on Queen's Island, so it's really coming home. Right, um, I'm going to talk about surname projects, but specifically Scots-Irish and very specifically Irving. And I hope, while it's, I, I often think that family history One's own family history is rather like summer holiday photographs. There's nothing more boring. Um, but I hope you can pick up, if you're interested in your own surname, the parallels and the lessons that may be relevant. And that's what I really want to get over this afternoon. So I'll be using my surname study, our surname study, as an example. Um, for those of you who are confused, it is very confusing. And even surname projects now are not just drawing on Y-DNA, but we're drawing on autosomal a little bit. Um, I've had to broaden my horizons a bit. I was very blinkered on this. But uh, particularly SDR tests and SNP tests I'm going to talk about. Don't ask me what they stand for. I don't know. You don't need to know. Um, y chromosome, for those who aren't, aren't with this, only goes down through the male line like the surname. And it's those differences that, that become so interesting. This is a new slide that I picked up on the web a couple of weeks ago by Mike Walsh. And it shows you at the bottom the sort of family tree, the first bottom inch, couple of inches, um, conventional family tree. And you can actually follow several surname lines back in your own ancestry. You can go to your um, father's, father's mother and then follow her paternal line back, or your father's mother's father. And go, so we actually can research quite a few surname lines. And they all go back to the genetic ad Adam, and I'll come back to that later. Now, the, the goals of a surname study used to be looking for paternal cousins and finding, breaking down brick walls. That's still relevant. But I actually, in my experience, had relatively little success with those. But that has been more than compensated by the amount I've learned about our surname through genetic genealogy that I never dreamt I didn't know. Um, like a lot of things in life, you end up with more questions than answers. Well, I'm ending up with answers, but I didn't know the questions. So I'm finding out the origins of the surname, and it's very interesting and how it spread. And we're now able to actually link paternal, some paternal genealogy into the DNA. I'm getting an overlap, which is perhaps the, the, uh, what we were all seeking unconsciously. And I'm now actually getting some overlap and hope to get more. Surname classifications, Debbie's done a, Debbie Kennett, um, she's not here, but she was lecturing earlier on, has done a textbook on this, and there are all sorts of ways you can do it. But the interesting bits to me are the bottom two examples. Some surnames are hereditary, most of the ones we deal with today, but if you go back a thousand years, it wasn't quite as clear cut, and people had second names, they're sometimes called by names, that they might have for a generation or two and then would drop. And you have this transient situation. For even for three or four generations, there might be a second name. And we're getting into that gray area, and it gets quite interesting. And also, you get very different characteristics. If you're a Brown or a Jones or a Taylor, the surname study is going to be very diffuse, 
and it'll be interesting, there are lots of things to learn. If you're a single source surname like Kurd or Austin, then you only have one ancestor and it's all very neat and everybody with that surname is going to be related. But most of us are somewhere in the middle, a fellow called Gleason here at the front and myself, and this is the, we're very lucky that we're sort of a bit of both and it's a grey area and you'll see why that comes up later on. Just a little bit about our, our surname. It's a, it's, a, it's a Scottish surname, but it's also found in England, Ireland, and America. Our project was founded now 13 years ago. We're up to 460 members, by no means the biggest at that level. Uh, a very strong American bias. 80% of those are Americans. I'll come back to that in a minute. And that's actually very good. They don't bring a lot of ancestry with them, but they bring a lot of money. And that has proved very relevant. Um, I can now show these Americans for their money that 92% uh, of them, I can say not only you came, you maybe they say maybe we came from Ireland, I can say yes, but before that you came from Scotland, I can tell them the county, and in some cases the actual parish that their paternal ancestors came from. And they think this is fantastic and it, it's very rewarding. Two thirds of this 460 belong to one family. So I've got 300 people who are all related in, in the surname era, which is the biggest group, I think, of any surname study, and it's a privilege to have that data to play with, and I'll be drawing on that. So we're now big into big Y and snip packs, uh, and we're actually, as I said, linking some of this into the conventional family history. So I like to look at surname projects in a broader context than just DNA, and I'm going to go through these seven inputs, um, because you can't, to me, you can't really do DNA without understanding something of the background. So I'll be going, this is the, the, the structure of my lecture this afternoon. First of all, traditions, they can be oral or written, and if you think you haven't inherited any traditions, just look in a surname dictionary, and your eyes will be opened at some of the rubbish that uh, academics think your surname is associated with, so it's, uh, it's uh, somewhere to start. Identify them, just think about them, and they all offer hypotheses that DNA can check against, so you, even before you really get going, you can have some structure to your work and have to bear in mind that some of your results may be quite controversial. And I now feel comfortable, but I can assure you early on in my project, it was a political battle. The, the Irvins of one bit of Scotland and the Irvins of the other bit of Scotland thought my results were absolute rubbish and uh, all the rest of it. And it took a long time to persuade them that, uh, well, it wasn't black and white, but the writing was on the wall. And uh, it's all history now, but it was uh, interesting at the time. We're very lucky, we have actually inherited a, a very detailed traditional history written in the 1680s. This isn't the oldest copy, it's in, this comes from just across the road in the Public Record Office. This is a 1784 version, but actually there as well, I haven't reproduced it, but it's almost illegible, is a 1690 version. It's not the original, it's by his son, who wrote this history of the, it's very, we call it Victorian, it's romanticized, um, but it's a lovely tradition, it is lovely, Unfortunately, it's not true. Um, but this is a good hypothesis, and this is where all the trouble arose when I was finding that a lot of it wasn't so. But in a nutshell, it says our surname. Everybody with our surname from Scotland had one ancestor. He started off in Ayrshire with the, by the name of the town of Irvine, just 40, 50 miles up there. And they moved to Dumfrieshire, and they had branches in Dumfrieshire. One of the Dumfrieshire branches migrated to Castle Irvine out in County, County for Manor, at the time of the plantation, they were sort of second generation plantation landowners. And then there was a branch up to Aberdeenshire, which has got the solid line, means we can trace that pedigree right back to 1300. It's a beautiful pedigree. And the assumption was these Dumfrieshire and Aberdeenshire ones were the same family, and which was the senior. That was the tricky bit. And then there were other branches. And I actually personally come off this one. So I thought I was descended from them as well. Alas, I'm not. And so I was disappointed, just like everybody else. Now, moving on a bit, population studies. This gives you more background as well. You can read through that list. We won't spend time on it. But, for example, in Ireland, we a map. This is the 1991 census done by a fellow called Neefsey. And the dots represent the concentration. And you'll see the Irvins, and the spelling doesn't matter. I'll come to that in a minute. Very much North Down and South Antrim. There's a bit out here in Fermanagh. Those are the ones I've talked about. There's some in Ross Common that we know about. There's some in Tipperary that I'll come to. And there's some somewhere in Linster, which may be those ones. I can't explain these ones. These ones, I, I suggest, are recent migrations. You know, people in the south moving into the metropolis. I'll come back to that as well. That gives you a feel in Ireland of 
what we're talking about. And of course, when somebody signs up to the project, you don't know where they come from, and you can't say, well, I'm not interested in you because you're Irish or you're Scottish or you're American, because, you know, we share a culture, if not an ancestry. In Great Britain, the data is a little more uh, ready. Going back to 1880, uh, quite interesting, because that's post-industrial revolution, but, but going back a bit. And you see the data on the, on the, on the right, on the left there, it's fairly scattered. When you anonymize it down to per unit of population, you'll see a very distinct grouping around the Scottish borders. And that is a very strong story. So we, we, we've got a gut feel, or not a gut feel, we've got some tangible evidence that that's probably where much of the surname came from. Orkney Islands, quite interesting, you see, that's my little bit, we're not insignificant, but nothing down here at all. So while it's a Scottish surname, the English bit is obviously the same family. First order. Spelling is very interesting. A lot of people say, oh, of course, we spell our name this way, so we're not related to you. And I think in most surnames, you come to recognize pretty early on, even in ordinary genealogy, let alone genetic genealogy, particularly when you've come from somewhere like Scotland and moved on to somewhere like America, the spelling gets terribly corrupted. So the different spellings, this is the world population count. You can get it off the web. This is my project population, and you'll see there's pretty good synergy. So I'm feeling fairly comfortable that I'm getting a representative picture. When you take information at random, people ring in, join up. I don't recruit anybody for this project. They've all come in voluntarily. You run the risk of it being biased for various reasons. And this is reassuring that the bias, there will be some bias there, but it's not too bad. And then you get the most popular spellings. And even in Ulster, in Belfast, it's I-R-V-I-N-E, pronounced uh, vine. Five miles down the road, it's the same spelling, but the pronunciation is different. And if you go down south, the spelling is different. So there are local variants, but they're not a rule. It's just a, a prevalence. I'm also keen that, and this is something that was touched on earlier in the day when Michael was talking, to get a feel more tangibly about the representation of the project in terms of numbers and where they come from geographically. I call it penetration. He called it something else this morning, but it's the same idea. So I've played around with some numbers here. And you'll see for the, in the world, the coverage is a very small sample, 0.16% in my project. Yes, it's big, but in the total population, it's insignificant. But rather like the opinion polls you read in the paper, if you've got 1,000 people, it can tell you how um, several million people are going to vote. And you'll see there's a spread there. Ireland, interestingly, very poor. Now, we all know that. We all know that. If you know your neighbours and your, where you came from, why spend money proving it or disproving it, even worse. Um, whereas the Americans, of course, uh, love signing up, so they're quite high. Um, one of the reasons I'm here today is to try and get that up a bit, because it is a bit worrying. But anybody can do, play this game. Be careful of the numbers. There the, are the, 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 the lots of uncertainties in that. But the feel, I think, is important. Now, when, we, when people join any project, they're invited to say where their earliest known ancestor came from. So here I'm looking at that data, not where they live, not where they originally came from, but their earliest genealogy. And you'll see Dumfrieshire figuring, which we knew from the general population thing, and you see scattered across the north, fairly even. So we've got something going on here. Um, bear in mind, this is mostly Americans we're talking about. So most of them can trace, a lot of them can trace their ancestry back to the north of Ireland, and then they get stuck very few of them can get back to Dumfrieshire. So it's beginning to get a picture before we do any DNA testing at all. And anybody can play this sort of game. We, we've been signed up for the project, and I'll come to analyzing that in a minute. Um, but this is what you can do, not even looking at the DNA test result. Um, now, as in family history, I think we're all here mature enough to know that family history isn't just about births, deaths, and marriages. It's the same in DNA studies. You want to look at the local history, the migrations, in this context, the plantation but figures very large, and how old is the surname? Uh, because you're getting back into that era. These are the sort of things you should be bearing in mind. Um, conventional genealogy is absolutely essential. Of course, we're only talking about the paternal side in the surname study. The longevity, how far it back it goes, is important. I'll come to that in a minute. Reliability is very important. It's a very difficult task when an American says, comes in and says, I can trace myself back to your William of Drum. I'm absolutely certain of it. And I know full well from his DNA that's absolute rubbish. But to tell him all his years, years of research that he's often paid for professionally is a load of rubbish. 
You have to be a bit careful how you handle it. And there's a huge amount of data to handle. 460 people's pedigrees is not fun. And then you've got the confidentiality aspect. So managing this is quite, a, quite interesting. And then the triangulation thing. Morris is going to talk about this, but I've got a private, private theory that you can use conventional genealogy to triangulate and verify your SDR data, but when you get to SNP data, which I'll come on to, which is more reliable, that is going to verify your genealogical data through triangulation. So it's a two-way process. Now, coming more specifically into the longevity, you'll see that the vast majority of us, because it's American and they have trouble, they can get back to um, the majority back to about in the 1700s. And, you know, it'd be nice to go further, but they don't. But in fact, we were lucky we've got eight, uh, six lines that go back to 1700, one of them to 1300, and that's 8%. And we've also got over half that go back before 1800. And once you get into the SNPs bit, which I'll come to at the end of the lecture, this is very relevant. As the SNPs get down, get down that low, you're within one SNP. Um, a SNP is about uh, every three or four generations you get a SNP on average. So even if you can only get back to uh, 1800, the SNPs can reach down that far. Just a couple of examples. This is the pedigree we've got that goes back to 1300. Um, I would say about a fifth of my project thought that they could attach to this. In fact, only six of them do. The first one was the Laird himself, and it took me about four years to get him to test. I know him very well, but he says, James, even if you pay for it, um, all I can do is lose on it because if it comes out not what we think. I've got egg on my face, and so have you, mate. Um, uh, but eventually I persuaded him. And of course, it came out not the traditional way, so he said, I told you so. Actually, he was privately quite happy, but that was a different issue. So we tested his cousin, and yeah, it wasn't a bish. And then we got two more, the, the, uh, these two, that one and this one, um, coming in, in the project, just randomly coming in and saying, I've got my pedigree. Does my DNA back it up? And lo and behold, it did. So this is triangulating right back to 1500, back to this one, this one, we go back to a common ancestor is about 1500 up there. So that was a very reassuring that the triangulation was going that far back. We've got two lines that I can't do anything with. This fellow, who is an American senator, or this one was, he won't reply to emails, but in fact it's not the end of the world because he's, or he's covered by this fellow. This fellow has done private research and he's scared of doing a DNA test because he thinks it might prove all his work labors, his work life's labors wrong, and he won't test. Well, you've got to respect that. It would be nice to have him because it would take it back three or four generations more. And then we've got this fellow, just one of them, who says, I belong, the DNA says he belongs, but he's got no pedigree. Only one of them, um, which is quite remarkable. Now, the other extreme, the border ovens, this is the, the group that's two thirds of it, 300 of them. The pedigrees are much weaker. They go back to 1500, and we've got two people they, who would be the lair, he lives in America, domestic issues, and the Castle Irving people out in Fermanagh. I've managed to test both of them. They match um, 2 by 37 with the mode, and there's one come off here that matches. So we, we, we know those two branches fit together, um, but that's all we've got on it. This is the fellow that wrote the traditional history. So he was very biased to these border people against the drum people up in Aberdeenshire. He's the fellow that... Uh, he is an interesting character. He was histori historiographer to James the Seventh of Scotland, Second of England. That's official. It's in the Windsor, you know, it's very pucker. He married and then he had a mistress as well and when he died his will was disputed and the son of the second marriage called his father in court an adulterer, a bigamist, a trigamist, a poisoner and a murderer. <laughs> And he wrote our family history, so perhaps we get what we deserve. <laughs> I've written a biography on him, but he isn't, written, isn't published yet. Uh, right, so here is the, the family history of the border uh, Irwins. We've got um, on the left the, the bit that I've been talking about, the solid black lines. Um, and the yes is under the first six in black over here. We can trace all those pedigrees down to the present day. So the, the Dumfrieshire bit, the Castle Irving bit and two more bits in Dumfrieshire we can trace down to the present day. And then I've got a lot of mentions in the 1600s, another six or seven branches. We don't know how they fit together. And ironically, we don't have any descendants living today. But we have 300 who've taken DNA tests who are descended from these people, but they've got a gap. 
So the challenge is enormous. 300 people have spent this money, and they say to me, why can't you prove it? Well, we're getting there, but it's, it's an enormous challenge. Um, it's, it's coming, it's coming slowly. I'm very privileged to be able to, have, to be given this challenge. Now, autosomal data can help. I'm not going to spend any time on it. This is what, um, what Michelle was talking about a minute ago. Uh, and now we'll get on to SDR data. So this is, after all that talk, I'm now going to talk about DNA proper. Uh, there are all sorts of tests. I think the 37 marker test is the best one. After that, I think you're, you're paying a lot more money. You're not getting a lot from it. To me, now, the important thing is you're getting a predicted haplogroup. So this is getting on to the SNP side of things. Uh, but before we leave it, the FTDNA's matching rules I'm going to talk about uh, and convergence. Um, if you do your DNA test and you haven't done one, this is what you actually get. You download it online. It's not a bit of parchment anymore. And FTDNA, put it on one of these tables, and uh, you, you've got lots of numbers and what the hell do you do with it. I like to put them onto a spreadsheet and handle it my way, and I can manipulate it and, and edit it to bring out the points I want to do and shuffle it and so forth. So you see in the big, the top bit, the, the first surname branch, um, this, these are the border ones I was just talking about, lots of identical people, you'd think they're all related. This is the first 25 markers, we can go up to 37, 67, 111. So the spreadsheet goes way out there. It also goes down, this is the first uh, 20 or so people, we've got another 300 and 430 to go on the bottom of it. So the spreadsheet is enormous. But you can see if you do the colouring from the counts, how they, if they differ, you can split them up into families. And it's this colorization that is perhaps the strongest tool. It's not a computer doesn't do it, and I'll come back to that. But you can see the different families. But before I go into that, uh, and some other points I want to make. Emphasizing this point, we've got 94% have got 37 markers or more, or put it the other way around, 6% haven't got a lot of markers. Now, that actually isn't the end of the world. My most valuable individual has only got 12 markers. I'll come to that in a minute. And I do feel that the money spent in 67 and 111, we're not getting a dividend from, at least yet. Big problem in my project is NPEs, not the parent expected or non-paternal events. And it can be all sorts of things. Uh, you know, if you read the modern books, it's all about surrogacy. It's infidelity, I think, is the most insidious. But I would lay my money that a lot of them are quite much more innocuous. Um, a woman marries, the, her husband gets killed in a border skirmish, let's say, in this context, quite romantic. Uh, she's got a young family, she remarries, and the young son of the first marriage grows up and takes the, son, takes the surname of his stepfather. Nothing wrong with it, perfectly predictable. And I think a lot of it is that. So let's not get too upset about morals and so forth. Uh, errors in genealogy are part of it. And this business at the transient period before surnames became permanent, you know, the shades of grey. Now, what, what are, how do these manifest themselves? Well, in the matching pages, you will get, sometimes you just get your surname. All the matches are your surname. Lovely. Sometimes you get gobbledygook. Well, that's a different issue we won't go into. But quite often, in my case, we're getting quite a few uh, um, Irwins um, in the Irwin DNA, but we're getting the Elliot surname, or we can be getting Elliot's DNA, but Irwin surname. And this crops up quite a bit. Um, and you have to be careful of double counting, and, and with one of them you have to be sensitive, um, the other they, they volunteer to join, so there's no sensitivity. But NPEs have these two sort of uh, facets. And if you read Hunter Round, it's actually quite predictable. In the, in the borders, there was a tough hybrid culture. If you were on the coach tour on Thursday, it was described slightly less flatteringly. I, I complained that they were talking about my ancestors in the most derogatory terms. Um, uh, but it was a feature of, of the borders that, 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 that this surname swapping, or, or whatever you want to call it, did go on quite a bit. And, of course, when they migrated, then the surnames got a bit corrupted as well. So it's a predictable phenomenon. But when you come to it, about 10% of my project has got people with um, our DNA, but other people's surnames, or other people's DNA and our surname. And if you run down those names, it's like when I was at school here, it's like a school roll call. All those Scottish names are quite common here in, in, in the north. Um, I, I could say that was... You know, I'd say that was a roll call from my 
my class at school here, just 10 miles away, um, showing that, that a lot of the Scottish names here in the north are, are mixed up. So we're get, and we're getting bells in both ways, you see. Um, we've got bells with Owen surname and Owen's with uh, Owen DNA with bell surnames. And it's, it's a fascinating feature. It happens outside the borders. It's not unique, but I think it's more accentuated in the borders. As I was saying, the matching rule, do you match, don't you match, the rule of thumb that FTDNA is four at 37 markers. I am now quite convinced that five and six, provided the surname is the same, they're good matches as well. So if you just use the FTDNA tool, you will actually be excluding a few, not many, a few um, quite valid matches, out to perhaps seven markers. Um, so we get false positives. You also get a lot of good matches with different surnames. Some of them may be NPEs, but of course a lot of them are just random matches and no help. There is a program now, Chase Ashley YDNA grouping app, uh, that will do all this uh, mechanics for you. Just plug in the data and it spits out the answer, but it still suffers from this problem of how do you define the genetic distance. So I prefer genetic distance of 7 or 37, and I used to be very keen on the TIP algorithm, which is a more sophisticated one. Uh, unfortunately, FTDNA fiddled with it, and it's not quite as clear cut. But rule of thumb, about 90%, 24 generations, is another tool you can use. So working out whether you're a match or not is not a science, it's an art. And I borrowed this slide from, from Morris's thinking. He hasn't seen it. I see he's sitting up, and uh, he'll recognize it, but I've tinkered it with it a bit. I've got 12 different fields, and... Um, you have to use a bit of all of them. This is the message that Morris was making before I was, full credit to him. Um, but of course, the most reliable ones are the ones in green at the bottom, the predicted uh, haplogroup. And then if you can do a SNP test, that, that will tell you, if you get the level right, um, whether, you're relate, whether you're in the same surname group. But 37 markers are generally quite enough. Um, 12 can be enough and you can usually sort it out. And the more data you play with, the more it becomes clear. It's seat of the pants. Uh, colorizing, there's no magic formula, it just hits you in the face, it's obvious whether you belong to the same family or not. So going back to that, this slide, um, analyzing it a bit further, this is the same data, analyzed a bit further, um, colors for the different families, so there's just five of them here out of 40, the top one of the borders ones, um, I, I include the kit number, the next letter is where they live at present, how the surname is spelt, the earliest confirmed ancestor, the haplogroup prediction, um, the number of markers tested, and then I use the top line as the modal one, and these are the genetic distances at the different marker counts, and then a tip score and some remarks. So you see here we have four of them from Dumfriesshire. So that's how I know that this big family comes from Dumfriesshire. It's just that four of them, or in practice about eight of them, come from there. All the rest are scattered all over the place, mostly in America, but I just know prove it, but I just, my gut feel, know that that is an Amphrisia family. It's as simple and crude as that. This one, uh, we get the NPEs. So there you've got an Elliot in this line who's got the, he's quite a close match to the Owen surname, but he's got the Elliot, the Owen DNA, he's a close match. He's got the Elliot surname. Here we have Owens who match very closely with the Elliots. So that's the evidence that comes up. Um, here we've got a couple of brothers who are, dis who are genetic distance of 2 at 25. I know the mother. She said to me, are you accusing me of sleeping with two different men? <laughs> I said, no, Margaret. One's got blue eyes and one's got brown eyes, and this is proof of it. Um, so genetic distance can happen. It's a random event, and you can get a distance of 2 in one family. And Bennett Greenspan tells me he's exactly the same, so good, ped good pedigree there. Here's an example of a count of five at 37. DNA would say that's not a match. FTDNA would say that's not a match. Um, tip score of 98%, it's very clearly is a match. So it would be a false negative if you excluded it. Um, this is my branch up in the Orkney Islands. So you may have heard of Washington Irving, the American poet. I find one of his descendants, got him tested, and he matches me. You can see these numbers compared to the Bonshaw ones, but you can see the counts are identical, so we're very closely matched. So I belong to that bit of the Orkney branch. Now we have some funny ones down in Munster, two of them. This is the guy that, that uh, you can see his Gaelic surname. He was a Catholic. He, 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 he can remember his grandfather speaking Gaelic. He knows the parish he came from, identical to the parish that this fellow came from, completely different. 
and they are Celtic Irish Irwins, and the reason I have the surname is it got anglicised way several hundred years ago. Us filthy Brits down there deserve the reputation we've got. We didn't treat them very well, and the surname got anglicised, and it's now Irwin, but they've got no Scottish connection at all. And we've got two families like that. And this is my proudest one. This fellow comes in with an E. It's completely different. It's only 12 markers, but it doesn't fit in anywhere. I said to him, tell me a bit more about your great-grandfather. And they said, we're proud as punch. He's, he was black as the ace of spades. He's a slave. He's emancipated in 1865, but we don't know any more than that. And I said, I do. Your slave owner was an Irwin. There's a lot of the ones that went from Ulster to America, went down to Carolina, and I'm sure, well, I know some of them were slave owners. So that's how he got his name. Just 12 markers. Interesting story. So our project has grown and grown and grown. Don't ask me how. I don't know how it's happened. I don't advertise. I just run a website that I try to do efficiently, and it seems to gain a reputation, and the numbers just go up and up and up, which is very nice. Um, but what's interesting is that I split them into families, and you see the number of families over the 13 years has gone up to about 40. But it's the unassigned, the leftovers, to begin with, they were about 50%. You can see that green line is about halfway up. And gradually that proportion, the numbers stayed steady, so now it's only about 9% of the total. So 92%, 8% of the total, 92% of them, I can put them into one of these genetic families, which is very satisfying. 40 families, but, but I can fit them into one of them. So here's the result, as it were. 40 different families, one big one, two-thirds in that one family from Dumfrieshire. Another 19 families of these NPEs who come from Dumfrieshire, um, but, let me look at it the right way around, these are the ones that have the Irwin surname, but ha I don't have Irwin DNA, they have Bell or Beatty or Armstrong DNA. The Aberdeenshire ones I've talked about, the Orkney ones I've talked about, the two Irish ones, some funny German ones, the one African one, 8% leftovers, um, so we've got 40%, um, and that's a, a breakdown of the conventional analysis. Uh, with a good, a, a well-administered a well -administered surname project, you should be able to get something like that for any project. Not many process it that far, but if you don't feel you're getting the service from your admin, you can do it yourself with a bit of help. So the old family, traditional family tree has been shattered. The four crosses have shown that the relationships don't exist, but we've got a lot more coming in here than we expected. Um, and the diaspora bit, most of them live in America, 76% live in America. Of those, the biggest chunk can trace themselves back to Ireland. Obviously, a lot of them can't trace themselves anywhere, they're still stuck in America. But 86% of them came from Scotland. So this is summarizing the migrations that have happened. And the migration from Scotland to Ulster would have been in the 17th century, I'm pretty sure, and from Ulster to America in the 18th century. 1850, 1840s, 1850s migration doesn't figure. I think that was mostly Catholics from the south. I think from the north, there was much less migration in that period. Certainly in our project, it was born out of there. Now, try and I then, this is with the SDR data, this is going back five years or so. We have this huge, this is the FTDNA printout. The World Families one is a little more illustrative. Um, but you'll see here a huge number, and this is the top half of it absolutely identical, so I thought they all must be close related. And if you look at all these guys on that particular marker, they must be closely related. It turned out to be very misleading with hindsight. And it's now more relevant to say, look, that one, that one, that one, and that one shows a sign of relationship. Because these markers are unstable. We thought they were God, but they are actually quite unstable. And the reason they're unstable is convergence. And again, credit to Morris, I think it was, who really drew our attention to this convergence problem. This is my simplistic explanation. You start off with one kind of particular marker. After five generations, it may have wandered uh, one or two one way, and after another five generations, it may have wandered a bit further. But the wandering is random, and that line and that line, when you look at it today, it's identical with the line that's come straight through. So you're getting an identical picture today, but they've come to this point through different routes and you can't tell that that's happened. And if you just look at the mass of that, it's about 22% if everything was equal. 22% of your apparent matches are misleading, there's been convergence. And actually, those numbers, I think, fit the real world. So my gut feel is that about, if you go back 
10 generations, 20% of your results suffer from, from convergence. So this is very controversial whether that number's in the right ballpark or not, but nobody's proved it to be a different one. Right, now we'll go on to SNPs. This has all happened in the last five years. I'm not, I could spend all afternoon trying to explain it. It's very complicated. There are all sorts of different tests, and you need to take advice. You can spend anything from $17 up to $800 and even more on SNP tests. Um, they give you, they're very valuable, but you can throw a lot of good money away. Um, so it's, it's complicated. I'm not going to this afternoon. I'm going to give you, show you what we can do with it rather than how you get there. One of the problems we have is a different way, just different labels. Everything in yellow is just a different way of describing a simple thing, an L21. They can describe it any of those ways. And L55, which is our private one, even more ways I've illustrated. All those things mean the same thing. Well, to a beginner, that's just so confusing. It's beyond belief. And when you're an amateur like myself, just learning trial and error, it was very confusing. Um, and I don't think there's a simple answer. Um, it's an unregulated industry, and different companies do things different ways. And we also use things like novel variant and known SNPs and private SNPs. SNP is SNP. When you lecture in Scotland, of course, it means something different. That's a problem we don't quite have here. Um, but I'm not going to in, go into what it stands for. Single something or other. Nuclear. Single yeah, but I won't pretend to understand it, let alone pronounce it. Um, but it is confusing. And then there are all sorts of manifestations about the three different types of SNP tests and how they differ from SDR tests. If you think of SDR tests, the other ones are like the leaves on a tree, then SNP tests are like the branches and the twigs. Or if you want to be cynical like me, SDRs are yesterday's news and SNPs are tomorrow's news. And I forecast quite sincerely, to the annoyance of a lot of my colleagues, that in five years' time, SNPs will, uh, SDRs will be history. I may be exaggerating, but certainly that's the way I see it going. Going back to this tree that I showed at the beginning, I'm not quite sure what this bit is and how it's cropped up, but never mind. But the numbers on this side I want to talk about. Um, up here, if we go, it actually, this goes back to 50,000 years ago. In fact, the oldest mankind genetically is, is another 100,000. But this is a slide by Mike Walsh. He's saying approximately 420 SNPs back that far. So most of us in this room will have four, five, 600 SNPs that are, we, we have inherited. Of those, all but seven, on average, will be before the surname era. So from my point of view, if we're not talking about ethnicity, I'm only interested in those last seven. And you pay $500 for your big Y test, you get 600 odd SNPs, but they don't tell you which are the ones that are in the surname era. And that's a huge problem for all of us to handle. It's getting easier, but it's, it's, it's again, the computers can't do it. It's, it's uh, all sorts of complications, but it's so exciting when you do get that. Now, you can see trees like this on the web. This is the R L21, so this is within the R haplogroup. group. It's halfway down that tree I was showing you. And it goes down to about the surname era is about here. And this is R L55. The fact we're out on the limb is probably symbolic of something that I don't understand. Much more important, we're right at the bottom. We're a very young SNP. The L55, we were very lucky, almost by chance. It happens to coincide roughly with the level of SNP is where our surname started. So if you're L555, you are very probably an Irwin. We find one exception now, which is quite interesting. Um, so it shows it's just about in the borderline. Under L555, which I'm going to talk about, is something just as complicated as that. But this is all before 1,000 years ago, 1,200 years, uh, 800 years ago. What I'm going to talk about now is less than that. Um, no, I've got one more before we... This is the most, most important slide of the lecture, perhaps. It starts at Adam, and it comes down to L555, and every colored annotation is one of our 40 branches. So I've plotted all 40 branches on one haplotree. tree. I've got rid of everything else that doesn't apply to us. This tree would go on forever if you did it. But all my 40 branches are on one tree. So I can show that the Aberdeenshire one, there it is, Drum Aberdeen, you have to go back about 4,000 years. So we are related, but long before the surname era. And our African friend, way over here, perhaps not surprisingly, 
And I in Orkney, I, that's me there, right out in the limb. Um, these ones are a bit closer, the same 222s and U106s there. But um, our L555s, this is this big group I'm going to talk about, are down here. So again, all this is pre-surname. The grey bit is Alex Williamson's big tree. And that is magic. It's just magic. You, a layman can understand it without any effort at all. So if you happen to fit in that bit, and of course that is it's probably 50% of the population, because most of us are R1B. In this room, half of us will be R1B. Is it about that? Something like that. So half of us probably, something like that? 70%. 70%. Oh, better more than half. So more than half of us would fit on this. And once you've done a, a SNP test, you may find where you are on that. The other thing is these asterisks that you see scattered around are pack tests. And that is the most powerful one. For $99, you can get a pack test that will tell you where you are on this tree. Uh, it's magic, that one. It's, it's, that's the one that's going to replace the 67 and 111 markers. Very, very good value for money. We've got our private pack test, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but you'll see them. They're a bit random, but they're growing all the time. They're the, the poor man's big Y. They cost about $100, and they've, it's a package of about 100 SNPs, and you just, they just bang it through. Um, very exciting development in the last three years. So next generation sequencing, this is, this is probably history now, but massive step forward. It's much simpler than it was when it was launched, but it's still mighty complicated. It is value for money, but it's still expensive. So we now have the pack panel test I was just talking about. The mid-level test is very good value for money if it's applicable, um, $99. And um, the low-level one, if you're lucky enough to have one, uh, is a much cheaper way of getting there. They're expanding. Um, and the results are yes, no. Um, actually, they're covering up shades of grey, but when they come out of this test, it's yes, no. So it's quite simple to analyse. So when we want to do the divide up L555 into groups, into families, um, what tools can we use? And I'm very anxious that people realize that 67 and 111 markers don't help much. They will help a bit. I was perhaps too extreme. But the only thing that really helps you is getting into the, the pack test or the big Y data. Um, Dave Vance is, is developing a tool that I'm playing with again that helps do it for you semi-automatically. But uh, this is quite advanced, but, but um, it's also controversial, which is why I wanted to put it up. Which test to take? So I'm recommending that if you're interested in what I'm talking about, you take a 37 marker test, and you stop there, and you go over to an M269. And then if you're lucky enough, you do a U107, L227, or L555, and there's some other ones. Um, think about going that way. It'll save you a lot of money. Most of my tribe have thrown money at it and spent a lot more. With hindsight, if we know what we know now, we could have got as far as we got by spending an awful lot less. But bless them, Americans, Americans uh, I won't say they throw money at it, but uh, let's say they, they don't mind spending the money, but they expect me to give them the answer, and it isn't always that simple. So FTDNA now do, they didn't initially, a very good tree. So this is the haplotree, tree, those fuzzy things I was showing you. This is a particular bit for, here's L55. And it's nice split up, you know, it goes way, way back to L21 and Adam, literally, um, genetic Adam. There's Z251, which is about DC 2000, L555, which is about 800 years ago, a, a simple step there. And then we've got all these breakdowns. So they're separate families, right? So there's a, a good dozen of them there. And then these subdivide more. Um, another tool you can use is WIFL. Um, John Cleary is somewhere around, very keen on this. I haven't used them very much, but if you don't put a lot of data in, you don't get a lot of data out. But you have to pay $50 a time for this, and I can produce all the answers that WIFL can produce, perhaps not as professionally, perhaps not as robustly, though I would argue that isn't necessarily the case. Um, but what I do is for free with a lot of sweat. But this is where you can do it without somebody having to do the sweat for you. Alex Williamson's Big Tree, just magic. Here's the L55 block. There's L55 itself. But all these SNPs are apparently identical. And as I said, we find one in here that comes out now. And then there's a subgroup there. They're all Owens. They're all Owens. And that's 12. And I've now got 25 of them. 
and these are all other surnames. So we're beginning to get down into the surname era of that level. This is what I could have shown you, um, where are we, three years ago. Um, on the left are some Irwins that aren't L55, and some right, on the right are some non-Irwins who are not L55, but fairly closely related. So they sort of would be cousins going back uh, 1,500 years. And these are my first 12 big Ys. Um, much relief and excitement. We thought we'd solved everything, but we hadn't. But it was enough to design a SNP pack test. And this is my latest family tree of our border Irvins. So up here, that top line is an Irvin, the first Irvin. We don't know who he was, but he lived about 1300 over in Dumfriesshire. And this is his family tree. And one bit of it somewhere around here is Bonshaw, and one bit of it is Castle Irvin. All the rest of it, we don't know who they are. But you can see we've got into enormous detail, and that's gradually coming down all the time. So potentially, it's terrifically exciting. Uh, and it's happening almost by the week, almost by the day. That, that's, you know, I did that last week, but it's, it's, uh, it's not quite the way I'm doing that. The yellows are a technical issue that have come up as they've redone with big Y, and, and um, we need to get some more data, but um, it's fringe stuff. And you'll see down at the bottom, that's big, the big Y level. These are the tests from the L, there's 25 of those. We've got 70 odd um, pack tests, and then I put some SDR data in and some um, genealogy. That's the SDR stuff. And autosomals there, and family history. So, you know, if there's a brother, you can put him in on this tree. So I've got about 140 on that tree of the 300, about half. I could now get onto a, onto a haptic tree, even though I can't identify them all. Here's the bit where, on the left, on the left, you can see Bonshaw and, and, and uh, Castle Irvin. The SNPs are right down into the conventional, the conventional genealogy that we've proven. So we're getting triangulation three ways with, with SDRs and with SNPs and confirming the genealogy. Um, but here we've got a big chunk half of what we've got is in this big chunk that obviously the pack test wasn't designed properly or adequately so we've got to go back and do more big whys it's a tedious process and here's the, perhaps the last channel these SNPs happen irregularly they don't happen every three generations you can go seven generations no SNPs and then a couple of them so we can have this one which you've got four SNPs but they may be quite recent and if your genealogy goes back to 1800, then there's a good overlap, so that would be Bonshaw. Um, or if it goes back here, it's not so bad. But here, if it doesn't, if the SNPs happened earlier and the pedigree doesn't go back so far, you've got a gap. Um, and here you've got a big gap. And uh, they're just random examples. But there's a principle here that, that two completely independent variables, and we, we don't quite know how either of them work. Um, we know how far back our genealogies go, um, but we don't know how far down the SNPs come. So there's going to be overlaps, there are going to be lots of tales of delight, but there are going to be some tales that we, we, we're going to struggle with. We'll, we'll get there in the end. So this is my summary slide to put all these thoughts together, sort of conceptual, what everybody should be trying to do. It brings in all, everything I've talked about into one slide, but it's, it's academic, it's theoretical, but it hopefully brings things together. What we're trying to do is to bring the haplotree tree down and the genealogical lineage is up, so they overlap. Conclusions. Um, DNA surname projects can do a lot more than we thought. The 737 rule is, is not, the 437 rule is, is too restrictive. Um, SDR tests at the higher levels don't add a lot. Branches do need big Y data, but the low level pack tests will help. And in the end, everything will help a little bit. Thanks to lots of people, including my wife. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Absolutely fantastic presentation, and the, the work that you've done on the on the urban uh, DNA project is is really uh, encourages the rest of us to aspire to the uh, to the levels that you've managed to achieve in that project. And every time I, I hear the latest update on the project, I think, wow, that's, that's really inspiring. It's, it's really uh, showing the rest of us where we should be heading. You know, and it's great that you actually have such a, a wonderful project, a wonderfully big project, because it actually allows you to do this incredible amount of yeah. work. Yeah. And does anybody in the audience have Irwin or Irvin uh, ancestors? 
Oh, there's oh. one lady there. Okay, and where are your urban ancestors from? I'm going to come down with the microphone so we can we can hear from you. I'm near Castle Derek in West Tyrone. West. West Tyrone. Tyrone, yes, yeah. My grandmother was Jane Irvine. My second great grandfather was James Irvine. And I've traced them back to the 1700s and the same place, but not before that. But I expect the Scottish and Presbyterians. Good. Well, the, in the migration, for every planter, and what happened with the Irvins and Castle Irvin, they weren't the planters, they bought the land off the planters in 1613, so they were virtually planters. But for every planter, you needed, and the, the history books differ a bit, I'm not sure it was 25 or 40, stout and strong men, who by implication would be what, Presbyterians, because that's what we're talking about beneath the surface, um, and loyal, let, let's put it that way. And of course, unfortunately, the motive was to hit the Catholics on the head if they ever got naughty. And come 1641, that policy was shown to be rather short-sighted. Um, but the point is, for every landed person who came over the plantation, there were an awful lot of people who were not landed, they were tenants, they may have been perfectly law-abiding, settled, well-established ones. Some of them may have been brigands that were kicked out because before we had transportation to America and, and Australia, it was transportation from the Scottish borders to Ulster. And the law records are full of them. And I'm not suggesting in a minute that your ancestors were part of that, but they might have been. Um, again, the majority were probably law-abiding. And your ability to take your ancestry back as far as you've done is terrific, but it's not untypical, and you get stuck. What I hope to be able to do, if you did a Y-DNA, if your husband did a Y-DNA test, is to attach you into one of those lines on that complicated graph, and maybe in five years' time I can actually say exactly which bit of the borders his ancestors came from. Let me bring the uh, microphone down to you. Here we go. I don't know directly. You haven't, you haven't got any surviving male Irvings? Um, maybe like four cousins, but I need to know that. Well, could I please say, even if you don't pay for a DNA test, get a saliva sample off them. Yeah. And, and <laughs> we might pay for it. I might pay for it if they've got a pedigree. Um, but the saliva you can't replace. But it has to be a male Irving. Yeah. And the same applies to any other surname project, of course. So it's only by DNA? All this has been Y-DNA. I did touch on autosomal at the very end. You can, it may help, but, but it's the Y-DNA that's the, the core of the project. Um, name variants, there's a grave in the little graveyard. The first one was E-R-W-I-N. second one was Lovely, all in the same, yeah. I've seen it in the same legal document. I've seen five different spellings in one document. I haven't heard of that number on a gravestone. Uh, but gravestones aren't, aren't uh, you know, they lie. I do know of a gravestone that's dated the 31st of February. <laughs> and it was carved about two o'clock in the afternoon after a good lunch. <laughs> and on that note, I think we have to leave it there. Ladies and gentlemen, James Irvin. Thank you, Morris. That was very good. Yeah. Mute you. Okay, and yeah. let me stop the recording. Finished on time for the first time ever. Well, indeed. I was impressed. And to get through the, the theory, to some extent, uh, was a, a great task.